several different texts. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 24. Um, Josh, can you turn me down just a little bit? That way when I start screaming, everybody's not... Yeah, that's better. That's good. Thank you. If I were to give you a key proposition this morning, one thing that I would want you to take away from uh, the message this morning is that Jesus, He appeared after His death and before His ascension as a testimony to His followers, as confirmation of Scripture, and to call people into service. What's the plan? Have you ever been in that awkward situation trying to figure out uh, what's next and uh, how to how to handle the scenario that, scenario that you've been dealt? I um, this happens to me from time to time when I'm uh, walking or out and about. I'll see someone and I think that I know who they are, and I'll like start waving at them, and uh, they'll wave back awkwardly, and then as I get closer, I'm like, oh, uh, well, I'll just be friendly. <laughs> it's one of those weird, you know, weird type things, and they're, they're, they're trying to figure out, like, do I know this person? And I'm thinking, I do know that person, and then I don't. Uh, awkward situation, and uh, just trying to figure out what next. Here is uh, the situation this morning, not necessarily, uh, that's a very light illustration for what's going on in Luke 24. But the people are trying to figure out, okay, what's next? What's the plan? How do we go from here? Our Savior is dead. Now, now what do we do? And in this, um, this text in Luke 24 and in John chapter 20, we see a number of people that uh, see Jesus as He, um, uh, as he recognizes uh, their, their need for proof, but also their, their, um, there's this communication that goes on, this teaching that happens. There's a... Uh, the confirmation of the scriptures, there is the, the help for them to understand their mission. All of that is taking place in Luke 24 and in John 20 and in other texts. So this morning, uh, point number one, we're looking at um, Jesus' appearance to his followers uh, made them eyewitnesses of his resurrection. I'm kind of answering the question this morning, why did Jesus appear to his disciples and to others after his resurrection? Well, their eyewitness testimony gives credence to everything that um, Jesus said was going to happen. And they, they then become the um, kind of the uh, spokesmen, the, the leaders of the church, etc., as they um, recognize Jesus is alive. In Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 10, it says... But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing spices, which they had prepared. And they found a stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the, woman, as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? Why do you seek the living one? among the dead. Interesting note here, the living one is a title that is given to him. Forevermore, he is the living one. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were, um, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. And the apostles were incredibly excited and they believed every word that they heard. No, verse 11. But these words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. But Peter got up, and he ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. This is the, um, an interesting thing that happens here. The, the, uh, the discovery, first of all, that the tomb is empty. And then to see the response of these women, the response of the apostles and uh, Jesus' followers. are like, well, yeah, this can't be, this can't be the case, right? 
kind of questioning, but Peter, he goes to look for himself. This text continues, verse 13, as Jesus then appears to disciples on the road to Emmaus. Verse 13, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of, them, uh, one of them stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? I can just, you know, I wish I, you know, the thoughts that were going through his mind as he's putting them in this scenario of like, All right, you answer me. What's going on? What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who, would, who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also, some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that, they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman had said, but, but him they did not see. And they said to them, O foolish men, and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them all things concerning himself in the scriptures. And later on, they sit down, have a meal together, and they realize that this is Jesus. And uh, then he vanishes, and they're excited. They run back to see the other disciples. These men on uh, the road to Emmaus, they, at this point in time, they uh, questioning these things, trying to figure these things out. Jesus appears to them, and they become eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. Secondly, we see this in uh, verse 36 of Luke 24. The ten disciples, or uh, the eleven disciples in, in John 20, the ten, Luke 24, verse 36 while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. But he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. This is a physical body that has been resurrected as he takes the fish and eats it. He's proving that this is, he is the Messiah, the resurrected Savior. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, Nineteen says, So when I, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is why I say 10, 11. He was not with them at this point, and then he, he arrives later. In verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands. 
picture Jesus grabbing Thomas's finger and like poking it into his hand, right? He's like, look, let me show you exactly what, what's going on. Reach here and put your hand, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. So we have a number of eyewitnesses, people who see the risen Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that there was a number of people, not just the ones recorded in the Gospels, that saw the risen Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 5, it says, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of them who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, says Paul. So there were 500 plus people that see this risen Christ, and they become the witnesses of his resurrection. Okay? Why would I go through all of these different texts and look at these different things? Just to prove this one point. God gave us many witnesses to prove that Jesus was alive. Angels even testifying of it, along with doubtful disciples and these prominent women and many others that testify of his resurrection. We can receive this testimony with confidence, right? If this weren't true, it would have been really easy to refute because these books were written in context. There are contemporaries that could have denied their testimony, but that's not the case. They're corroborating the story that he is alive. And so we rejoice in that. The second thing we see this morning is that Jesus, he appeared to his disciples and others um, to help them understand the scriptures. As I mentioned already, there was those that were on the road to Emmaus, and um, as, they're, as they're talking with Jesus, he's explaining to them in Luke 24. What does it say? What does he explain to them? He says, Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. We don't know exactly what was taught. Probably he's sitting there explaining some of these uh, sacrificial pictures. He's helping them understand what has been portrayed, explaining why the why the Passover, the the blood is spilt, the lambs are killed, why they do things the way that they do, and reminding them just as the blood was put on the doorpost and the death angel passed over, his blood would be a, a covering and it would be in such a way that God could pass over and forgive sin. Think about the Ark of the Covenant as they sacrifice the lamb and they take the blood and splatter it on the Ark. And as that blood hits the Ark, it turns that yucky brownish burgundy color. And over time, it creates this covering over the Ark. Again, pointing to the covering of blood that Jesus would be, perfect spotless lamb that would be slain. Perhaps he's sharing passages with them from Isaiah. Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, maybe it's from Zechariah. Maybe he goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, probably, as he explains beginning with Moses, right? Genesis chapter 3, speaking of uh, one who would crush the serpent's head, but it would bruise his heel, right? And as he explains all of these things to these two men, they become like the, the chief scholars of Old Testament theology at this point, and they run back to the rest of the disciples and they have to explain these things that have been taught to them, explain that they have seen the risen Christ and how this could be so. Peter and John, they, they run to the tomb and they're trying to put these pieces together, right? In John chapter 20 and verse 9, they're trying to understand, it says, um, verse 8, so the other disciples who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. All right, so John and Peter, they're in a race kind of getting to the tomb, and John lets you know, hey, I got there first. And uh, as he gets there first, then Peter's the one who barges into the tomb to see what's going on in the tomb. It says in verse 9, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. 
So the disciples went away again to their own homes. And so they're, they're trying to put all of these pieces together. And in God's sovereign plan, he, he brings Jesus back into the, the picture to teach and instruct and to um, confirm Scripture. They were taught these things in a way that would help them as they served and as they ministered. And we see this in Luke 24 and verse 44. That these men were commissioned from there. Luke 24 and verse 44. And now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Again, he's saying, Hey, you remember? I told you these things before. Let me just bring this up again. That all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the, third, from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things and behold I am sending you forth. I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in that city until you are clothed with power from on high. So they're given this, this commission, and Jesus comes into the scenario, and he says, look, this is my word, and he puts all the pieces together for them to understand that this is what, what he spoke of, that what he had talked about. I think it's Matthew chapter 16. Do you remember when Peter and Jesus are having this little conversation? And um, he asks Peter uh, who he is, right? In verse 14, well, let's go to verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And he continues on, and... Um, Verse 20, then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he is the Christ. And then Jesus tells them that he's going to die. Verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Jesus told them what was going to happen and they didn't get it. Peter takes him aside, verse 22 began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So here, Jesus appears to them. He's not saying, Hey, I got you, I told you so, ha ha. He's saying, Look, let me explain this to you again. Let me make sure you understand what is happening. It's happening as I said it would. And they're given this, this commission in this, uh, this understanding of the scriptures. So Jesus appears to them to give us eyewitnesses, to help, under, help them understand, help us understand scriptures, but also to help them understand the mission, right? In John chapter 20, verse 19, this mission is given. John chapter 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors were shut. Where the disciples were, they were afraid. The, that word shut, it doesn't mean that they just closed the door. It means that it was barred. It means that it was locked. Uh, the disciples are afraid, okay? At this point, their leader has been killed, and there are others that could come after them, right? As, the, as he... Uh, was a leader. They were following him. They were afraid. 
they themselves might be arrested, might find persecution, etc. So as they are afraid, they lock the doors, and boom, Jesus came and stood in their midst. How did Jesus get there? Some people say, well, he, he was hiding, and then when they came in, he popped out. I don't think that's the case. That's not what we find here in this text. And some say, well, he actually found an open window. And so he came in through a window. And that's not in the text either. He came and he stood in their midst. How did he do this? He has a glorified body. And in that glorified body, he is able to appear where he wants to appear. I would say it's in the same way that when the disciples go in and find his uh, his um, the garments the the thing that they what they wrapped him in to bury him they find it laying in its place be exactly the same way it was just boom he decided he was going to go and he went he decided he was going to appear and he appeared he stood in their midst and he says to them peace be with you do you think they got it he had to say it a second time right. When, they had said, when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And it's kind of like these, these, this emotional roller coaster that they're on, and this idea of peace, shalom, is that all is well. All is where it should be. All is as it ought to be. And so he's saying, all right, calm yourselves. Don't be you know, they're incredibly fearful. He says, all right, calm yourselves. Make sure it's all as it should be. I am here. It shows them that he has risen. And then they're rejoicing and they have this big high. And he says, all right, calm yourselves. This, let me just, you know, everything's the way it should be. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. The Father has sent me. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. What does that mean? As the Father has sent them, I also send you. Why did Jesus come? We talked a little bit last week. Just before Jesus' triumphal entry, he meets with someone in Luke 19. He meets with a man named Zacchaeus. And in verse nine, chapter 19 and verse 9, he says, I will give four times as much. This is Zacchaeus repenting. He's giving back. He's trying to make everything right as he has made the decision to follow Jesus. Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus was there to seek and to save that which was lost. And so in John 20, where he says, I'm going to send you, just as the Father has sent me, what is he commissioning them to do? To go and seek those who are lost. And so Jesus says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And these men are called into ministry from fear to now following Jesus. They're brought along in understanding this mission. I think that we see this pretty clearly in, in John 21 and verse 15, this, this conversation that happens between Peter and Jesus. We won't go through the entirety of this text, but remember, Peter has, uh, has had a rocky um, background, right? Uh, Jesus tells him, you will deny me three times before the, the rooster crows. And sure enough, he denies Christ, even as Christ is going through um, the process of crucifixion. And so he meets with him, and he commissions him. He calls him back. He, he, he says, I, I want you to serve me. And he does this three times, even as Peter has denied him three times. Now he calls him into service three times. And he says, you follow me. Take care of my sheep, shepherd my sheep, feed my lambs. There's some interesting things going on in that passage with the, the word love that is used, and we won't get into all of that this morning, but understand that Peter has been humbled, and now he is called back into service of, of Jesus. And so this morning we look at this and we say, okay, this is incredible. Uh, what does this mean? 
there's, there's eyewitnesses. Okay, that means that I can understand that this is uh, something that can be trusted, that Jesus did come back from the dead. I, I can understand that the scriptures are being put together for us and that even in the Old Testament, hundreds, thousands of years prior to this event, um, this was God's plan in redeeming humanity. I say, okay, that's spectacular. We get to this last point, that now God gives us uh, a purpose. Now God gives us a mission. Not only does He give His disciples a mission, but He gives this mission to us, as this is supposed to go forth to the nations, right? As is mentioned in the beginning of the book of Acts, and as has been already um, we've looked at in John 20. So we're called to reach the nations. And looking at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, a little bit more, I know that we're kind of moving back and forth between these different texts, but we're, we're trying to put such a big story into this, this context and help us understand some of the significance of it. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told... Verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ. Whom did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised? For if the dead are not raised, even Christ has been raised. Not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we, have, we are of all men most to be pitied. He says, all right, so here's the deal. If he is not alive, these are the consequences. This is the result, right? If he is not alive, number one, our preaching is in vain. It's, there's, there's no point to this message that is proclaimed. Number two, your faith is in vain. There's no point, no reason in believing in someone who is dead, right? Number three, if he is not alive, then we are liars. We are uh, we are liars about God. We are liars about what has, ha you know, what we say has happened. Number four, if He has not come back alive, we are still in our sins, and there is no hope for us. The dead will perish. Number five. Number six, we are to be pitied. We are to be pitied. How pitiful would it be? to be someone who peddles a message about a dead Savior that cannot do anything for you, cannot solve your problem, cannot you know, deal with the sin issues. It would be empty. It would be pointless. And so what we have is a, a number of people who witnessed this event of a resurrected Christ. Not only that, we have the Scriptures that confirm that there was a resurrected Christ. And then we have this building up to the purpose that you have been given in Christ to proclaim this message, and it's not empty because He is alive. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, 
so that the testing or the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 is a key, key verse. He says that you have been, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is connected to having a living hope. So apart from a risen Christ, there is no living hope. The living Savior is connected to a living hope. Just as sure as Jesus is alive is how sure we are in our salvation. That's how important this is in this resurrected Christ. And He is alive. And so we can have a living hope. This is the good news. That we can have living hope. We have been separated from God because of our sin. And God said, I love them to the extent that I will send my only begotten Son into the world to die for them. Do we deserve it? No. What do we deserve? We deserve punishment. We deserve separation from God. We deserve hell. And God in His mercy, as it says in verse 3, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has extended hope to us through Jesus Christ because He's alive. I... Um, I'm grateful and thankful that uh, my, my little girl is so matter-of-fact about things. Sometimes that's really good and sometimes it's really bad. Sometimes it's really good in that you know exactly what she's thinking and it's just there and she's going to deal with it and it's straight, straightforward. Other times she says things and it's straightforward and it's like, okay, that's a little bit blunt. You need to back off a little bit. And uh, sometimes it's hard and dealing with her and those two things. But on the plus side, with her being so straightforward, uh, we're... Our family is rejoicing today um, because Nora, uh, in her blunt, straightforward way, walks into the kitchen yesterday and says, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. And so we're like, oh, this is incredible. Um, and she says, I have been sinning a lot towards my brothers, and I know that I need Jesus to save me from my sin. And so Katie then has the the blessing of being able to have that conversation with Nora and uh, so uh, so straightforward that she's just like, okay, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I do things that are wrong. I look at the way I treat my brothers and I know that I need to, um, I can't do anything about it. And so she says, I know that Jesus is my answer. And so uh, we rejoice in that. We do. Jesus is the answer, not just for Nora, but he's the answer for all of us. Amen. And so uh, this morning, let me just encourage you. Uh, this is not something that we have to complicate. Often the gospel gets complicated. And we say, okay, well, if I want to have this life, I want to have living hope, then I have to, I need to make sure I go to church. I need to make sure that I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything right. I need to make sure that I wear the right clothes. I need to make sure that I, whatever it is, right? None of that is here, right? The gospel is precious in that God says, come as you are, and I'll be the one to take care of cleaning you up. I'll make you what you ought to be. So this morning, uh, or that last night, we are my wife was having this conversation with Nora, and she's still thinking about these things so matter-of-factly. And she's like, you know what? I think this means I should be nice to Julia today. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, I, I have Jesus to help me. And so, you know, hopefully that's the way it went. <laughs> but in that process of following Jesus, there's that, that changing, that cleansing, that uh, sanctifying work that the Holy Spirit has in our lives. As I was thinking through this, uh, I'll give you some more insight into the way that I think a little bit. Um, every now and then, I get into my own little world, and uh, I start thinking, and I chase down these foreign little thoughts, okay? 
it might be something as random as like, why does Swiss cheese have holes in it? Or um, if I were falling from an airplane, what would be the best way for me to try and survive without a parachute? And as I, you know, sometimes these things come as like distractions from what I should be studying. And other times they come as a distraction and I'm like, oh wait, but there's a spiritual truth in this. And that's what happened as I was thinking. Uh, I had this, these thoughts of hiking with my, my boys and as I was thinking about hiking with them, we were on the edge of a cliff and these rocks began to give way. And I was thinking, okay, what would I do? Uh, am I strong enough to like throw them back up to the edge? And I went through these different scenarios of like, okay, what if this comes down and what if there's a creek? Is there, an, is there a way for me to jump off of this rock at the last minute to land in the water? Is that how I can survive this, this scenario? Um, and thinking through these different things, I came to this conclusion of I should, look for, uh, I should look for a root from some tree that's coming out of the cliff. And in my mind, I was like, oh, there is a root. And so I grab onto this root, and I'm holding onto it, and I'm like, all right, now what? And then running through the scenarios of like, okay, so now do I try and climb up this root to get to some safer spot? Or do I just hold on for dear life as long as I can? How long is this going to take before someone can save me? Etc. And as I was thinking about those things, I came to, uh, out of my own little world, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I should be studying. Let's get back into this. And I was like, wait, there's a spiritual truth in this, in that when, uh, when I was falling, I was looking for something that would save me. And I found some security and understanding that there was a root that I could hold on to. It's like, man, isn't that so much the way that it is with the gospel? We're all falling, and we are, we're broken, we're in a bad shape, and we're going the wrong direction, right? And then God reaches out His hand, says, here, grab onto this. It's something you can hold on to. It's something that's sure, something that will give you peace, something that takes care of that, that fear, the anxiety, the, what the disciples are going through is this fear and anxiety. And he says, here's your answer. Hold on to this. So this morning, we get to rejoice because there is something to hold on to. We get to rejoice because there is something that is sure. There is a living hope because there is a living Savior. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no other way to have that living hope apart from Jesus. Have you reached out this morning and have you grabbed onto his hand? Have you put your faith in what Jesus has done for you? Apart from putting your faith in Him, there is no way. There's no way to get to heaven. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus. It's very um, exclusive. There's only one way. But that one way is offered and extended to everyone. This morning, that offer is extended to you. As a sinner, there is an answer in a Savior. And if you say, okay, great, I've come to that conclusion. I know that I have a Savior, and I know that I can trust in Him. And what next? Well, we have all of this uh, commissioning, this, uh, this purpose that He's given to us, in that we're able to have the same goal that Jesus had, to seek and to save that which was lost. He says, all right, that's what I want you to do. Now go and do it. Because Jesus is alive, we have a mission. If He were not alive, we, our preaching would be in vain, right? We are of all most to be pitied. We're proclaiming a lie, right? But that's, none of that's the case. This is true. And so we have this message that we're able to proclaim to the world of hope. We need God's help to be able to do that. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you, 
have extended your grace and your mercy towards us, allowing us to have this relationship with you. Thank you that you are more powerful than death. Thank you that you sent Jesus on our behalf to be a sacrifice for us to take the punishment that we deserved to exchange my rags for righteousness as he is a perfect covering. God, I thank you that we can be recognized as righteous and holy because of what Jesus has done for us. I thank you that through the resurrection of Jesus that we're able to have confidence, that we're able to have this surety knowing that uh, the disciples saw Jesus, that 500 others saw Jesus, that you explain the scriptures to them, and then they go out and they are um, bold with the gospel. Many of them dying for their faith. Father, I pray that you would help us to be bold with the gospel. We recognize that the, uh, the nations are our mission field. As big as that may seem, Father, we recognize that the, um, the nations extends to our neighbors, our family, our co-workers, the people that are around us. Father, I pray that you would help us to communicate the hope that we have in a risen Savior. Father, this morning, if there's someone here that hasn't put their faith in you, that they haven't recognized Jesus as the, the way to have this hope, I pray that today you would work in their hearts, that you would bring them to that point of desiring to um, follow you, putting their faith in nothing else but in that work on the cross, what Jesus has done. turning from our sin to you. God, if someone's in that situation this morning, I pray that you would be at work, draw them to yourself. Father, help them to see their need for a Savior. I pray that you would redeem people. Father, I pray that you would use us as your witnesses, as we go out this week to communicate the redemption that you offer. We thank you for the grace that you've given us today and allowing us to be reminded of these truths and be able to worship you, rejoicing in the living hope that we have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.